Welcome to the Ernie Chambers Show. I'm Ernie Chambers back again, and I'll give my mantra, I am what I am, and that's all that I am. This day, I'm going to do like I usually do, which is to say something very briefly about Cyrus the virus, otherwise known as COVID-19. As Black people, we are dying every day, along with the other people who deny that COVID even exists, who are opposed to taking the vaccination. I know that I cannot force anybody to do anything. I do not want to force anybody to do anything. I wish I could stimulate your pure minds so that you would get a clear focus on what it is we're talking about and how serious it is. The rate of COVID infection is rising in Nebraska. There are 50 states, as you all know, in the United States. The lower 48, as they call them, which make up that map that everybody recognizes, then there's Alaska to the north and Hawaii across the water, 50 states. Nebraska is not known for much of anything, but it has the 14th highest rate in the country. There are not really that many people in Nebraska. Your governor is a man who has his eyes on a higher office with the Republican party, because due to term limits, he cannot run for governor again. So he's going off on all these tangents, making these ignorant statements. And when I say ignorant, I mean from the sense of not knowing, lacking knowledge about what he's talking about, but he runs a head anyway, like a bull in a china shop. So if you all out there want to roll the dice, hope they don't come up snake eyes, you're free to do so. I know, and everybody else knows, that if Cyrus the virus gets you, you're going to sing a different tune. What I decided to do is read a little ode, that's a short poem, dedicated to something or someone, and it's called Ode to COVID-19. By the way, there was a king, his name was Pyrrhus, and he was at odds with the Roman Empire. He had a fight with them on the sea, and he threw all of the forces he could muster into that battle and he won. But in the process, he lost so much of his fighting capacity that he ultimately lost the war. So when somebody talks about a Pyrrhic victory, they mean you won the battle, but you lost the war. It's like somebody would score a punch on Muhammad Ali. Maybe even as in his later years, knock him down. But in the long run, over the long haul, Ali would emerge triumphant. Here it goes. Cyrus the virus, extremely desirous of raging like uncontrolled fire. Cyrus the virus did pin on papyrus, would that all humans expire. Cyrus the virus does not admire us. If it could have its own way, it would inspire us, then would require us by recklessness ourselves to slay. Osiris the virus, forget not King Pyrrhus, who dealt the Romans what for? A victory he won, but when all was done, King Pyrrhus lost the war. Cyrus the virus, the fate of King Pyrrhus awaits you if man but relents. Your days are numbered when minds unencumbered embrace medical science and sense. I'm not going to say more 
on Cyrus the virus right now. Sometimes I become whimsical. All of creation, as some people call it, all of the physical universe, as some people refer to it, in my mind, everything is interconnected, whether they call it animal, vegetable, or mineral. Discoveries are being made every day. One that was made some time ago that people don't even know is that fish don't exist. There was what was put together by scientists, taxonomists, those who name objects and animals, called a ladder of being. And at the bottom rungs were the more primitive, as they were called, creatures. And then each step up meant that there was a creature with greater development until you got to the very top where human beings and their arrogance felt human beings would be. All creatures in the sea were referred to as fish, whether they were, they had shells, whether they had spines, claws and jaws, whatever, they all were called fish simply because they were under the sea. That would be like saying, you've got a mountain and everything that lives on that mountain because of where they live are related to each other. So if you have a mountain goat over there and a little mountain chipmunk over here, they both are related because they live in the same place. And then if you have a human being, that human being is there. Therefore, the human being, the mountain goat, the little chipmunk, then bless Peter, a snake, and then some spiders are all related to each other because of where they live. Preposterous. But that was the notion taken with all things in the sea. Scientists started using computers to put together the traits of these various creatures to see not even what they look like, but what they have in common. So one may have a shell. It may be under the water. It may have scales. It may have slimy skin. But in reality, in terms of its internal organs, the way they operate and function, they are more closely related to a cow in a pasture than to anything else in that water. That sounds fantastic, doesn't it? The word intuition means that you go by a feeling or a sensing, not factual, not science-based, but just a hunch. And hunches have led human beings astray to a great extent. There are plants that are considered weeds because humans don't understand the value they have. They could be medicinal in nature and have the cure for ailments and diseases that were overlooked because the lowly so-called weed was the source of the cure. Do you know why clover is considered a noxious weed? Because there were plants, oh, let me say this, factories. I don't wanna confuse plants where automobiles and other things are manufactured with plants that grow out of the ground. They develop a herbicide. Some won't pronounce the H when it's with herb, S-H, not herbicide, herbicide. But however you pronounce it, it's still the same. It would eradicate clover. So to make money, they proclaim that clover is a weed. And that's how many things in this society wind up being misnamed and as a result, misused, unused, and confusion results. So what I do on occasion in my whimsical moments is to try to look at the world through the eyes and not all things that I imagine that I'm a part of would have eyes even, but that's a figure of speech. 
meaning you're going to put yourself in the place of it, whatever it is, that you're going to adopt that place and perceive the world the way that whatever it is perceives it. And I use the word perceive rather than see because some people, some things experience the world through their other sensory organs. I saw an article in the World Herald the other day. The date was, it was on a Tuesday, November 16th, and there was just a picture of this huge blue spruce, blue spruce that was going to be the official Christmas tree for Omaha, and it was being put up at the Union Station or some, some big place where everybody could come. And then I said to myself, within myself, how would the world appear to a tree which may have developed and grown to its present height? This spruce was 40 feet high over years, maybe human generations only to be chopped down by a human being to be a part of a pagan celebration. If that tree could think and express itself, what would it say? So I decided to put myself in the position of a tree, not the giant spruce, because nobody has any sympathy for very large things. Shakespeare said, Oh, it is wonderful to have the strength of a giant, but it is tyranny to use it like a giant. So rather than assume the position of a huge organism, what about that organism when it was still small? People sympathize with baby anythings. So here's what I came up with. The title is, oh, the article was labeled in the Omaha Star, Omaha World Herald, carrying on a tradition. And it's the tradition is to have an official Christmas tree for Omaha. And this one was put up at the Durham Museum, but it's called carrying on a tradition. And that was the tradition to have this tree. The title of this rhyme. I don't call what I do writing poetry, but writing rhymes. And some people say, well, all po poetry is, is verse metered rhyme. If you write with meters and it rhymes, that's poetry. One who writes poetry is a poet. That which is produced is a poem as opposed to prose. Carrying on a tradition and I put in parenthesis from perdition because we're speaking from the standpoint of the tree. Christmas from a tree's perspective, it's very short. The mighty blue spruce shaded mother doe and baby fawn. Then one day so tragically, the mighty spruce was gone. For the little spruces, twas a mournful bitter cop, cup. Sadly did they weep, we hope we never do grow up. Human beings viewed the spruce as just another tree. To the little spruces, twas a horrid destiny. Christmas time made humans joyful, little trees forlorn. Broken hearted, they wish Jesus never had been born. Little trees would never know the Jesus irony. When he reached maturity, men nailed him to a tree. I wrote a soliloquy of a dandelion. And a soliloquy is when you talk to yourself. Here's what the dandelion said. But before that, I put a biblical verse because these I handed out to the senators and they pray every morning, although it doesn't mean anything. And things which are despised 
hath God chosen. 1 Corinthians 1, 28. You who from this world would take me, why not rather that God which did make me? Yes, that God which made the lamb, did he not make me as I am? Respect you only the fine of features. Who said you to value God's creatures? Are you with your small finite mind able the sum of the infinite to find? Shall a creature be doomed to offend because its purpose you don't comprehend? Ask the poet why oaks are made taller and stronger than the weeds they shade. You who formed neither sky nor sod, are you more knowing than all knowing God? Weighed by a truer scale, you also oh pious may be found wanting scant weightier than yon virus. Humans whims come and humans whims go. Humans vain glory, most fragile of snow, kissed by the sun, melts, evaporates, then vanishes, leaving no sign it has been. As I set forth my appeal as I ought, I cannot but wonder, is it for naught Here's the summation, the dandelion, after making its appeal. I too exist and have a role to play. Let me cast a shadow. Now, what about weeds who are judged and misjudged? And there's something more to these rhymes than just weeds and dandelions. Apply it to the way human beings deal with each other, the arrogance, the ignorance from which flow all types of false notions, mistreatment, and other things that befall human beings. Here is a little rhyme that I started a lot of my poems, I may as well call them, but I say they're rhymes. When I'm going to use something from the funny papers. Wisdom's a treasure. They who have mined it know that wisdom is where you find it. One need not take exotic trips. Wisdom is even in comic strips. A profound truth the wise have learned. The simplest of things should not be spurned. There used to be a program on the radio and this is the way it would always start. It was a soap opera. Imperious man, look into your heart and dwell on this. And then they'd say something like, without the woman in my life, where would I be? But this is what I want you to focus on. Imperious man, look into your heart and dwell on this. Does a real distinction separate a good plant from a weed? It is argued that a good plant satisfies some human need. Based on this conclusion, plants described as good are tolerated, while weeds, on the other hand, are doomed to be exterminated. Nature, mother of all living things, if we but pause to listen, teaches she loves all her children, whether doom, dim or if they glisten. Throughout history are plants which human ignorance condemned, only later to be found dread diseases, dread diseases to have stemmed. Have you never wondered why weeds unattended flourish so, while plants men cultivated oftentimes do scarcely grow? Weeds are mother nature's natural children, so are strong and hale while each cultivated plant is but her stepchild, weaker and frail. Thus, the weeds we hate today may be discovered to our sorrow, to have been great curatives exterminated to our sorrow. So, imperious man, ere singing, weeds have got no value song, pause and think it possible, imperious man, you may be wrong. Now I'm going to get down to some 
earthly stuff. Here's an article from November 9th. Husker Hoops will continue to use song, Hoiberg says. Ricketts criticized playing, the playing of this song, lift every voice and sing, often referred to as the Black National Anthem. The University of Nebraska will continue to play what's often referred to as the Black National Anthem before Husker basketball games, despite Governor Pete Ricketts' objection. Ricketts is not only a dumbbell, he is an out-and-out -out racist. Head men's basketball coach Fred Hoiberg said Monday that he had talked with Husker athletic director Trev Alberts and women's head basketball coach Amy Williams about continuing to play, lift every voice, and sing. Hoiberg said the three of them have decided to continue the practice. Last week, Ricketts criticized the practice as divisive. In a tweet, the governor said, quote, there is only one national anthem for the United States. It's the Star Spangled Banner. It's a symbol of our national unity, and it's the only anthem for America that should be played before Husker games. First of all, if a national anthem has any significance, it shouldn't be played at athletic contests, but nevertheless, they are played. What I've told people repeatedly on this program and told them in the legislature, the words to the national anthem were a poem written by Francis Scott Key. And Francis Scott Key was a slaveholder. And while holding slaves, raping black women, assaulting little girls and maybe little boys sexually. He had the nerve to call America the land of the free while it was a, the only slaveholding nation in the world with the kind of slavery it had, where they owned people like cows, pigs, chickens, bred them and sold them at auction, the land of the free and the home of the brave. How brave are these white people? And do you know where the melody came from? The tune to which Francis Scott Key, the slaveholder, made words available. There was an old British drinking song called To Anacreon in Heaven. Anacreon had to do with these drinking songs. So you have words written by a slaveholder and the melody from an old English drinking song. And Ricketts doesn't know that. White people in general don't know it. Most people don't know it. And yet they talk about being against so-called critical race theory, which is merely telling the truth about American history. And Ricketts and his ilk know just enough to be aware that it was slaveholding. There was rampant rape and brutality visited on black men, women, and children, white men committing adultery, as well as sexual assaults and pedophilia, sex with little children. they have the nerve to talk about honoring this song whose origins they don't even know. They need to learn something about their history. Don't expunge it, learn it. Malcolm said the study of history is best able to reward our endeavors. Ricketts also tweeted, if athletic programs are going to play other anthems, which is not the case, before games, what has historically been a moment of patriotic pride will become nothing more than a series of political gestures that will divide Nebraskans based on their identity rather than bringing us together. And everything he's doing right here is doing the very thing he says that playing lift every voice and sing would, would do. He's bringing about division. He's making a political gesture 
and he's dealing with identity of white people as superior, anything related to non-white people is inferior and has to take second place. I don't know if he was in the military, although I never went overseas. I never shot at anybody, nobody shot at me. I served four years in the army and I got my honorable discharge. He didn't. I didn't do that for a flag. You know why I did it? I wanted to go to law school. I went, go to finish my education without being drafted. They were drafted in those days. So I got in the ready reserves and I was subject to go overseas whenever that unit was called into service and they were having all kind of outbreaks in Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. And you never know when the unit would be activated. Even the National Guard gets activated. I had to do summer camps where you have active duty and then go to weekly gatherings. But at any rate, I did my time. Ricketts as a rich kid didn't, I'm sure. And I didn't do it for a flag and nobody I talked to did it for a flag. None of the drill sergeants did it for a flag. A flag is a rag. It's a symbol. What you do these things for, if you're white people, or if you're people of any nationality, and you have a stake in the country, and are not there against your will, it's for the sake of that country and what it stands for. What would a black man have to fight for in a war in which this country fought, not against the enemy in front of us, but the enemy behind us in what would be called the homeland, were we not treated like subhuman beings. We are fighting two enemies all the time. The ones in front we can see and are allowed to shoot and kill to benefit those enemies we have back here who want to treat us like dirt. I'm overseas and Johnny Jones, a white kid is overseas and letters are written back and forth and letters cross in the mail. Johnny Jones writes home and says, that old Chambers, he's a good old boy. He's colored and everything, but he saved my life. Your son, Chester Jones. And old Ernie gets a letter that passed that one in the mail where Johnny was writing his parents that I saved his life from my family telling me, Ernie, your father was lynched by the Ku Klux Klan in the United States of America. The one whose uniform you're wearing, the one in whose war you are fighting, for what? So that these racists back here can kill your family, burn your home, rape your women, and that's America. And this racist dumbbell, a rich man's kid, has the nerve to say that playing a song is wrong. Let me continue. Hoiberg, speaking at a press conference Monday morning, said the Huskers had begun playing the song last year. Ricketts didn't know any of this. To provide unity after the National Association of Basketball Coaches suggested the song. The National Association of Basketball Coaches, which is 99 and 9 tenths white suggested that the song be played following the racial turmoil of that summer. In a statement, the group said the song is recognized as, quote, one of the most cherished 
of the African-American civil rights movement and is often referred to as the Black National Anthem, unquote. The university, Hoy Bird said, will continue playing the song to promote unity and inclusion. Hoyberg said the university has, quote, heard a lot of positive feedback and obviously a lot of negative feedback on it. Continuing the quote from the coach, in talking to Trev, and Trev Albert is the athletic director at UNL, in talking to Trev and talking to Amy, she is the women's basketball coach, we have decided to continue on. We will change the format of it. The national anthem will be played first. We will clear the flag and then to promote unity and inclusion, we will play lift every voice after that. They ought not have the flag at all. The flag doesn't symbolize freedom to us. It is the symbol of our oppression. That's why I sit on the floor of the legislature. Y'all pray, y'all honor that flag every morning. To me, the flag is a rag. Everywhere I see the flag, I know there's racism. The flag was on the uniforms of those white cops who took Rosa Parks to jail for sitting in the wrong seat. And as I've pointed out, and I'm gonna try to scamper through this, she sat in what was called the colored section when she first got on the bus. But because more white people were getting on the bus, they moved the sign farther back. And so although she's sitting in what the white people designated as the colored section, now was no longer that because white people wanted it. You can live in this house as long as we don't want it, but when we want it, we're gonna take the house, your land, and we're gonna rape your wife in the process. That's what white people have done. I'm not making it up. It's in their newspapers, it's in their movies, their dramas, their novels. And something like a little song. But at any rate, these coaches associations decided this song needed to be played. The American flag should not be there because the, the American flag besmirches and dirties everything because of what it means in this country in terms of being the symbol behind which the Klan does its dirt, the far right does its racist activities and depredations, and worn on the uniforms of the cops who brutalize and murder Black people, including women and children. Oh, the brave white man. Hoiberg said all Big Ten schools that stay out on the floor for the playing of the national anthem also play Lift Every Voice and Sing. Continuing his quote, I've been really proud of our team the last couple of years for using their platform to address issues that have been going on in our country and hopefully promote change. But for us, we feel as sport, hopefully, we can help be an example. We have players from all over the country, all over the world that have to come together and play for each other and be one. And obviously we need to be better in our country in that area. This is a white man making an acknowledgement, unquote. A spokesman for Ricketts said Monday that the governor stands by his statement. Taylor Gage is a spokesman. He did not elaborate, but included a link to Ricketts' earlier press release. Senior Husker forward Derek Walker said in an interview Monday that playing the song is important to the players. Quote, when coach told us that they want to take it away, I was honestly shocked because it's just why and who does it affect, Walker said. And when you hear this song, how does it make you feel? You can come out and support us and watch us play basketball, but the song, you hate the song. It's still a reflection of us. And I feel like if you hate the song, you hate us. And he ain't wrong. Walker said Hoiberg is, quote, innocent, unquote, and does not necessarily see the things that the members of the team go through. But he tries to understand and, quote, 
lets us know that we're not alone and he has our back, unquote. Then he continues with this quote. Just with everything going on, especially over the last few years with just police brutality, the systemic racism and everything that people of color have been through, continuing to play the song is big for us, Walker said, but us do not count for these racists who love to come and watch us run on the field, run up and down the court, hit the volleyball over the net. It's all for the entertainment of these racists who in fact hate us. Walker continued, we've all come from different places and to be told that there's only one right song for the nation now, I don't feel like that's right, he said. The governor making an issue of the song is what's divisive, said Cynthia Robinson, chair of the Black Studies Department at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. She called Ricketts's position and comments absolutely ridiculous. Quote, why is the governor weighing in on it? And the very first thing that's being talked about is divisiveness. The country is already divided. The governor brings the song up. He makes it political, and that then becomes divisive, unquote. She said the playing of the national anthem at sporting events is about building national conformity. Quote, the, stash, the Star Spangled Banner, she said, brings an aura of obligation. Fans have to stand, take off their hats, maybe put their hands over their hearts and sing. On the other hand, lift every voice and sing is not obligatory. Quote, we want to act like there's no racism in a country that was founded on racism, Robinson said. So black people having a song is threatening. A song is threatening. They wanna take even that. The lyrics to lift every voice and sing are actually inclusive, said Justin Payne, an adjunct professor in the UNO Black Studies Department. He teaches a course called Music and the Black Experience. The song he noted was written as a poem by NAACP leader James Weldon Johnson in 1900. His brother, John Rosamond Johnson, put it to music. It is said to have been performed for the first time for the late President Abraham Lincoln's birthday. Quote, the lyrics give a story about an exodus from slavery to freedom, unquote, Payne said. You all have heard that song, Exodus, that the Jews like? This land is mine, God gave this land to me. They don't say anything's wrong with that because Jews are brand X white people but you let them get out of their place. Then that ugly thing called anti-Semitism rears its ugly head. There are Jews in Germany who when Hitler and his brown shirts first came on the scene said the things I'm hearing can't be true. They can't be that bad. Just like there are black people who don't wanna believe these white people are as bad as they're going to be and are right now. Then when their neighbors started disappearing Rumors began to swirl, talking about gas chambers, about corpses being burned, mass graves. Then too late, the reality hit them that was right in front of their eyes, but they didn't want to see it because it was too horrible for the human mind to grasp and retain its sanity, continuing anyway. where I left off, the lyrics give a story about an exodus from slavery to freedom, Payne said. Payne grew up singing the song reverently as a hymn at his church, Pleasant Green Baptist in Omaha. It generally resonated more with older generations, he said, but the appreciation for it has grown again among young people because of the Colin Kaepernick initiated controversy over the national anthem. Quote, I don't necessarily see it as political pain said, more so as a song of history and hope because it speaks about a journey. Now, guess what I have here? 
I have an editorial written in the Omaha World Herald Sunday, song promotes unity, Ricketts' criticism is divisive. Then it quotes, shadow beneath thy hand, may we forever stand, true to our God, true to our native land, our native land. Then the editorialist continues, Governor Pete, Rick Pete Ricketts finds this divisive. We disagree. And while we understand his political motive all too well, are saddened that the governor has taken to weighing in on every single cultural issue. Even a song rooted in the American story that celebrates freedom, even a hymn of reverence and gratitude to the same God the governor worships, and I would add, or pretends to worship. Even a song deeply meaningful to Black Americans as a recognition of their arduous journey from slavery toward American liberty. For those not familiar with this dust up, Ricketts on November 5th issued an official statement complaining that Lift Every Voice and Sing, which the NAACP in 1919 declared to be the Negro National Anthem, was being played alongside the Star Spangled Banner before Husker basketball games. Ricketts' statement said, quote, there is only one national anthem for the United States. It's the Star Spangled Banner. It's the symbol of our national unity. And it's only the only anthem for America that should be played before Husker games. If athletic programs are going to play other anthems before games, what has historically been a moment of patriotic pride will become nothing more than a series of political gestures that will divide Nebraskans based on their identity rather than bringing us together, unquote. In fact, writes the editorialist, it is Ricketts's comments that are divisive as they were needless. Were he seeking a solution rather than scoring cheap political points, he could have reached out to the athletic department behind the scenes, but solution and sensitivity clearly were not his goals. Let's rewind to the awful summer of 2020 in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and the protests it launched nationwide. Confronted once again with our country's struggles with race relations and equality, business and political leaders promised positive change as they have so often before. Ricketts was among them. After a kerfuffle, that means a little dust up, over his referring to Nebraska black leaders as you guys, which was misheard or misstated as his saying you people. No, he said you people. And a tape of what he said was doctored to try to put in the words you guys. He said you people and all of the black people there knew what he said. They took it as an insult, some walked out. He didn't say you guys. And that's not the kind of terminology the governor uses anyway. Even when he's talking to white people, he doesn't say you guys, but he's a liar and a trickster. He puts the devil to shame. And the devil said to me one time, Chambers don't give rickets to me. We don't do the things he does. We don't stoop to the depths he stoops to. He will be better if he rises to the level of the things that the devil does. Anyway, Ricketts told black radio personality, William King, he was quote, learning the culture, unquote, of the African-American community. At a separate news conference, he said issues for communities of color and access to equal justice, quote, are real and important. That's what he said when he was in his lying mode. Among the institutional responses to events that summer was a decision by many sports institutions to begin playing Lift Every Voice along with the Star Spangled Banner before games. The NFL did it. The NBA did it. 
the National Association of, Bas Association of Basketball Coaches suggested it for college games. And all Big Ten teams that stay on the floor for the playing of the national anthem now also play Lift Every Voice and Sing. And you got this idiot racist governor in Nebraska carrying on like he's doing because he's imitating the things he thinks will put him back in office in another capacity because he can't run for governor again. Continuing. These sports are dominated by black players and including the song as a show of respect. These great athletes are not stage performers for white fans who get to set the rules. They are stakeholders and it is only proper to include their views in shaping their competitive and work environments. The guy who was the athletic director Creighton found out he created a hostile work environment when he referred to the players leaving the plantation, the racism inherent in that statement, and some of the players that left the school and others who had said they would pledge to come there as players changed their mind. That's the racism and what it does. We still are not viewed as people, we're viewed as things and commodities and play actors. Continuing, the Nebraska Athletic Department's response to Ricketts was both perfect and mature. It is changing the order in which the songs are played with the national anthem first, men's basketball coach Fred Hoiberg said. Next, quote, we will clear the flag and then to promote unity and inclusion, we will play lift every voice after that. Nobody has ever said the national anthem stands for unity and inclusion because it has so many lies in it. Continuing, we don't think anyone was confused about which song was the US national anthem as Ricketts seemed to suggest, but the change is a reasonable compromise. Besides being the right thing to do, playing Lift Every Voice is helpful in showing recruits that Nebraska is a welcoming place. That's true not just for athletes, it is absolutely essential for our future economic health. Business leaders across the state have long recognized that Nebraska must promote and live out diversity and inclusion if it is to attract and retain millennial and younger workers needed to address Nebraska's acute labor shortage. The Ricketts administration drew praise on these editorial pages for adding $10 million to its campaign called The Good Life is Calling to attract these workers, but the governor routinely undercuts the needed messaging. Back in June 2020, Ricketts asked King to judge his heart, <coughs> excuse me, and apologize for using, quote, trigger words, unquote. Has his heart changed? Or perhaps the potential for GOP political gain from Huey, such as overhyping critical race theory and criticizing hymns is just a lot more important to him, his political future. Playing lift every voice and sing before basketball games is not divisive. It is respectful and extends a mu musical hand for us all to grasp in unity. Ricketts's regrettable choice to put politics before equality and inclusion deepens the division that is tearing at our national fabric. We would be better served if our leaders instead chose to promote healing. That's from the World Herald and their history is spotty and not good. But you can give some slack about what was when what is now is erasing that bad, trying to rectify it after, an acknowledge, after acknowledging it. Let me now go to something else. After the World Herald editorial appeared on Sunday, this is in Tuesday's paper, Governor Pete Ricketts on Monday 
urged Husker fans to treat opposing players respectfully, even those who kneel during the Star Spangled Banner. The governor spoke out about the fans who shouted at three Maryland volleyball players when they took a knee before the Maryland-Nebraska volleyball match Friday night. Among the shouters, according to Landon Flux, who sang the national anthem, was one who yelled, stand up, you piece of trash, and they probably used the N-word. Ricketts weighed in on Monday in response to a question at a press conference about adoption. At a press conference dealing with adoption, people still wanted to know about this divisiveness the governor caused. Quote from Ricketts, I think it's disgraceful to kneel before the national anthem, especially when we're talking about Veterans Day, the governor said. We have people who died for this flag. Nobody died for the rag. If they died for a purpose, it was what the country stands for, not a piece of cloth. If they cared about that rag, they wouldn't put it on bikinis that women use to cover their crotches. On what men, men's jock straps are called, their banana hammocks are made out of it, bandanas that these bikers wear, and the U.S. Code says that the flag should never be a part of any athletic uniform, but it's a part of all of them. It is on the uniforms worn by referees. The flag should never come in contact with the ground. But when a player with a flag on his uniform or a flag on his helmet hits the ground, where is the flag? On the ground, then they pretend that the flag means so much. That's nonsense. It's never to be a part of an advertisement. You see garbage trucks riding with flags on them. But anyway, here's what Nick, Rick had said after saying people died for this flag. Having said that, however, we're also known for having the best fans in college sports. I don't know where that comes from. And two wrongs don't make a right here. There was only one wrong, what these white people did. Quote, our fans should be respectful to the teams that come in from other places, unquote. If they're not, then Nebraska's going to be off the schedule. That's what he's concerned about in the athletic department. The game was played one day after Veterans Day. The incident, now get this, the incident left several Husker players in tears. After the match, Coach John Cook said that he was disappointed at the fan behavior and that a volleyball match was not the place to express those personal, personal views. University of Nebraska Lincoln Chancellor, Ronnie Green and Nebraska Athletic Director Trev, Trev Alberts also called for respect and Alberts apologized to the Maryland volleyball program. After the, the match, the Nebraska players met with Maryland players at the net to apologize for the pregame incident. These athletes understand things and these racists in the sign stands understand them too, but they're not gonna do us right. And why do I not like your governor? Your governor took out after me before he even got elected. These racists know that if they attack me, it helps them politically. Here's an article from a newspaper out West called the Lexington Clipper Herald and it was, this story was written May 10th, 2014, before the governor was even elected. Lexington, Nebraska. If local voters need a seal of approval, they got two on Thursday afternoon in the form of former Nebraska Governor Kay Orr and former Nebraska Congressman Bill Barrett, who both endorsed Republican generational candidate Pete Ricketts. Both former public servants were on hand at the Lexington Grand Generation Center Thursday as Ricketts sought to seal some local votes before the Tuesday primary. Why would I read this? What has this got to do with anything? Ricketts is campaigning for governor. I'm going to show you what's on white people's mind in Nebraska. During a question and answer session with residents after his talk, Ricketts said if elected, he would not allow 
the tactics of Omaha Senator Ernie Chambers to hijack the agenda of the legislature. He's not a legislator. If what I'm doing hijacks the agenda, let the legislators do something about it. But this racist Klansman addressing people he considers to be Klanspersons feels he has to take out after me and he doesn't know me to get into their good graces. And many white politicians have campaigned for an office while campaigning against me. They bring me up in their campaigns and say what they're gonna to do to me when they get in office. Never has it panned out, but anyway. Here's what Ricketts went on to say. Ernie is a smart man, but he is one man. You have to have a coalition to set the legislative agenda. I want to grow that coalition so we don't get tired of talking about mountain lions, Rick had said. Now here's a man running for governor talking about building a coalition in the legislature of white people against one black man. And there are black people who don't even know the power that I had there, the power I exercised, the way I dominated the process, the proceedings, and was on people's white people's mind all over this state. They didn't ask him about whoever he was running against. They didn't ask about anybody in the legislature. They asked about one man and you're looking at him and you all who are black in this district who voted for me knew what you were doing. And I have never betrayed this community. As I say, this blood is in my community this and this community is in my blood. The governor, when I got the bill passed to abolish the death penalty and he vetoed it, he wanted to try to get senators to vote against overriding him, not by saying that something's wrong with the death penalty, but that they would be identified with Senator Chambers. That's how much terror they have of me. Listen to this. This is from May 27, 2015 World Herald. The governor used the veto signing to make another appeal to lawmakers he hopes to flip on the repeal of the death penalty bill because it had passed. Quote, this is a matter of public safety, he said. It's also a matter of making sure our prosecutors have the tools they need to be able to put these dangerous hardened criminals behind bars. Even though I disagree with that, he's entitled to his opinion, but then he crossed the line. Several times Tuesday, the governor linked supporters of repeal with Omaha Senator Ernie Chambers, who introduced LB 268 and has worked for decades to abolish capital punishment. Quote from Ed Ricketts, a vote with Senator Chambers to repeal the death penalty sends the message to criminals that Nebraska will be soft on crime, Ricketts said. You see the depth to which that gutter snipe will stoop and you wonder why I call him the things that I call him, but I haven't called his mama a name. I feel sorry for her for birthing such a one as him into the world. You won't see profanity come out of my mouth. There are enough words in the English language for me to describe my enemies, but then I understand English and speak it better than they do. Chambers said Tuesday, he believes senators who supported his bill through three rounds of debate did so as a matter of principle. Then in the Lincoln Journal Star of the same date, Chambers said supporters of repeal will not be voting with him as Ricketts suggested several times Tuesday. They're voting on the basis of their conscience. They're voting with a conservative movement around the country against the death penalty. They're voting with Pope Francis and the Catholic Church and with their colleagues who are the same party and persuasion, he said. Most of those senators have cast their votes based on conscience three times, he said. This is a shining moment for the legislature, Chambers said. We can take this state out of that period of darkness and bring it into the light of civilization and humane justice. 
there was a Christmas uh, birthday card that Rick had sent to me on my 80th birthday, and I sent it back to him. And here's the headline from the World Herald. It was July 15th, 2017. 80-year-old Omaha Senator calls Ricketts' message sour sarcasm. A recent birthday card from Governor Pete Ricketts was not considered Nebraska nice by the state's oldest state legislator. State Senator Ernie Chambers, who turned 80 on Monday, called the best wishes expressed by the governor sour sarcasm in a written response Friday. Chambers, who has frequently clashed with Nebraska governors, see, I don't throw a rock my hand and hide my hand. I don't need a lot of company along with me. And I go after the big people, not the little ones. I help the little ones. Chambers, who has frequently clashed with Nebraska governors during more than four decades in office, said there was bad blood between him and the Omaha Republican even before Ricketts took office in 2015. And I read to you the, where Ricketts said he was gonna to come to the legislature and build a coalition against me. The North Omaha Senator wrote that he could not have a wonderful summer as Ricketts had urged in his birthday card because of the governor's quote, heartlessly mean, cruel vetoes earlier this year that cut funds from the developmentally disabled and providers of social services. I'm the bad guy. I'm fighting for the developmentally disabled, for additional funds for those who provide social services. And he's got a lot of people believing I'm the enemy. I'm sending messages to criminals, but he's the one actually hurting them. Chambers also criticized the governor for dismissing his call three weeks ago to fire State Patrol Colonel Brad Rice for alleged mismanagement of an internal investigation. I said the governor should fire the head of the State Patrol. This is the response. Ricketts, the spokesman, Taylor Gage, called the senator's suggestion on June 20th ridiculous. Ridiculous. But four days later, the governor ordered an investigation of patrol leadership and on June 30th, he fired Rice, the head of the state patrol. I don't bite my tongue. I say what I believe needs to be said and whoever gets in the way, well, let the chips lie where they fall. Said Chambers, who'd have thought you would do such a ridiculous thing? Chambers wrote in his response letter shared with reporters. When asked to comment about the criticism of the birthday card, Gage said there was no sarcastic in intent. Quote, the governor sends birthday cards to senators and their spouses with sincere greetings and messages, G Gage wrote in an email. That's all that I'm going to go through today. There is much more that I want to say, but all things come to an end. And my time today has come to an end. I'll be back next willing, next week, as the old folks used to say, Lord willing and the creek don't rise. But to sign off as I always do, in the words of the canary, who was told that the, the, cage, the door to his cage was open, I'm out of here. Thank you for watching The Ernie Chambers Show. If you'd like to make suggestions, email us at ewcfacts at gmail.com. That's ewcfacts at gmail.com. This has been an EWC Communication Production.